Modern art. It sells for a fortune in exclusive galleries, but what's it ever done for us? Has it influenced the clothes that we wear, or the buildings that we live in, the cars that we drive, the books we read to our children, even the way that we think? I'm Alistair Souk, and I earn a living writing about art. And in this series, I'm going to explore the life and work of four titans of the 20th century. Henri Matisse, Pablo Picasso, Salvador Dali and Andy Warhol. They all changed their world. But have they changed ours? This week, Dali. Salvador Dali is the showman of 20th century art. He was born with a very mischievous sense of humour. He really honed our understanding of the absurd, showing us that anything's possible. And he brought to life extraordinary dream worlds in his vivid surrealist paintings. We all know what surrealism means. It's something that conjures a sense of the bizarre and the unexpected, or the irrational. But the fact that we do is entirely thanks to Dali, who brought surrealism into the mainstream. But with his eccentric appearance and absurd antics, many just dismiss him as a clown, a celebrity-hungry self-publicist. So was the art he created really that important? And has it changed the world we live in? If you mention Dali's name today, most people think of, well, they think of a big moustache and melting clocks. And I reckon that the persistence of memory is Dali's most popular painting. This is reproduced and parodied everywhere. The actual painting is in New York, at the Museum of Modern Art. So that's where I'm heading first. And here it is. Now, don't be fooled by its size. This is 10 by 14 inches of Dali dynamite, exploding with ideas about time, dreams, and our most intimate fantasies and fears. Nearly 80 years after it was painted, there's something that still haunts us about this picture. It has the strange, airless quality of a dream, but one that's quite unsettling, that you never forget. It's as if Dali has taken our intangible anxieties about time passing and mortality and crystallised them in paint. What is it that makes it so compelling? Perhaps it's because Dali paints impossible worlds in a very realistic way. They feel real, and in a sense, they are. Because Dali's landscapes are based on a place that he loved, the dramatic coastline of the northeast corner of Spain. Dali was born 30 miles inland from here in 1904. His father, a wealthy lawyer, was a strict disciplinarian, while his mother spoilt him, and it was Felipe who first encouraged Dali's art. His childhood memories, dreams and desires seared themselves onto his mind so much that arguably they saturate almost every painting he later made. Dali once said, I have been made in these rocks. Here have I shaped my personality. I cannot separate myself from this sky, this sea, these rocks. Nestling in this rocky coastline is the town of Cadaquez. The Dali family used to spend their holidays here, and it's where I'm meeting Dali's biographer, Ian Gibson. And he fell utterly, totally and madly in love with the place, and I can understand why, because it's quite magical. Tell me about Dali's family. Well, he had a terrific family. I mean, this photograph, which was taken more or less here, and this is Dali sitting there, Probably be five or six years old. I love the fact that he's positioned himself right in the middle of this early yes. stage. So you always have to be at the centre of things. How important is it to understand this place um, in terms of his later art? Uh, it's absolutely vital. I mean, all the early drawings, the early paintings, the church figures, and I don't know how many of. And I would say everything here: the people, the houses, the architecture, the boats. And without Cadaquez, there is no Dali. 
it's as, it's as straightforward as that. I think really he identifies totally with this landscape. Dali's childhood paintings of Cadaquez show his incredible natural talent. He made this one when he was just 15. You know, he could draw from, from the day he was born. He, he just had it in the blood. He, I suppose that's why he thought very early on he was a genius. And did he, everyone he could He could do it. And everybody said, he can do it. When he paints a duck, it's a duck. When it's a swan, it's a swan, his mother said, as he scratched off the paint on a, on a table in Figueras. He just was born with this gift. It's hard to believe from his gentle, sun-drenched teenage paintings that Dali actually had a troubled, anxious childhood. This is the church. It was only in later years that these anxieties would be reflected in his work. This screen is stunning. It's stunning. It must have influenced Dali as a boy, don't you think? Absolutely. I mean, you, you couldn't but be mesmerised by this uh, altarpiece. Lots of Dali's later paintings, his surreal masterpieces, they're really very disturbing, quite unsettling. There's a darker side to Dali which starts to emerge here as well, no, right? Absolutely, there is a darker side. And those uh, empty beaches with hardly anybody there are distant figures, uh, always alone. And I think he was terribly lonely uh, and anxious and very, very timid. And then there's the, there's the anxiety about his mother. He is very close to his mother, but his mother is not very well, and eventually she dies when he's still very young. And that's a terrible loss. Then he's left alone, he has to face his father, and his father's a very violent figure. And Dali is uh, frightened of his father. He admires him, he'd like to be like him, but he's frightened of him. When he was 18, Dali moved to Madrid to study fine art. Here, he began to overcome his extreme shyness by developing a new, eccentric persona. He began to wear dandyish outfits and grew what would eventually become his famous moustache. His student arts displayed outstanding technical ability and Dali certainly knew it. His shyness was transformed into unbridled self-belief. He was actually expelled for making the outrageous statement that none of his teachers was good enough to examine his work. Going to Madrid was the first step in the young Salvador becoming Dali. Dali was in his early 20s when he first heard about a group of experimental artists in Paris who were creating strange, fantastical work. So strange, in fact, that a new word had to be invented to describe their art, surreal. Discovering surrealism would change Dali's life. Was surrealism? Well, it started out as a literary and artistic movement that was launched by this man, who is the French poet André Breton, in 1924. And it began really as a revolutionary response to the devastations of the First World War. And also, it was inspired by the psychoanalytical theories of the great Sigmund Freud. Freud believed that all of us have got this inner unconscious world in which our emotional and sexual feelings are repressed and that the only way to express ourselves is to release these emotions but without censoring what comes out. And the Surrealists were fascinated by the bizarre, quickly decided that they needed to explore this new forbidden landscape of the unconscious mind. Someone like Giorgio de Chirico created strange and haunting landscapes in which these odd, oversized objects that really don't belong together dominate the canvas. A little bit later, the Belgian artist René Magritte started painting conventional bowler-hatted businessmen pouring out the sky. Putting it all up together, suddenly you realise why the young Dali instinctively knew that surrealism was the artistic movement for him he could express himself with impunity and put onto the canvas all of his inner desires, fears, obsessions and anxieties. Like here, in one of his earliest surrealist paintings, Honey is Sweeter Than Blood. The barren shore of Cadaquez is scattered with strange objects that represent his childhood and adult anxieties. Inspired by Freud's ideas, He's liberating his unconscious obsessions through his art. Death and sex were clearly on the 23-year-old Dali's mind. To extract these strange visions from his deepest psyche, Dali developed a technique 
that he called the paranoic critical method, based on Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytical theories. I haven't a clue what Dali meant by this, so I'm on my way to meet psychoanalyst Darian Leader in the hope he can explain. We're meeting at the house in North London where Freud lived after escaping Nazi-occupied Austria. Dali himself visited here in 1938 to pay his dues to the great man. So this is Freud's study. This is actually the study. It is indeed. This and this is, is, this is the couch. This is the Freud's original couch indeed. I've heard a lot about this quite complicated term, the paranoic critical method. What does it mean? I think the main thing of interest is the notion of paranoia. This is what Dali was really interested in in the late 1920s, early 1930s and then beyond. He saw paranoia as an essential mechanism in the construction of reality so that when we see, let's say, some rocks or a cliff, we could say that's just some rocks or a cliff, but we could also see in it the human form, perhaps even something looking at us, a big pair of eyes, exactly what would be classified as a paranoic delusion. Dali, in a sense, explores and develops this idea in his painting. So, for example, here, seen from one angle, we have a scene perhaps in a desert or on a beach, a number of figures in front of a dwelling with some trees behind it. Then turn it and we see fairly clearly a human face. Now, what's the correct way to interpret the image? Dali's saying that both of those ways of reading the visual data give us different answers, exactly the kind of emphasis on double images that Dali was so fascinated in. Dali's arguing we interpret the visual data that we're receiving and we can interpret it in different ways and that there's a fundamental question about how we interpret the world around us. So Dali's idea is a bit like that game we play as kids, where you gaze at clouds and let your imagination run wild, perceiving animals, objects and faces in the random shapes. But instead of clouds, Dali would head out to the rocks near Cadaquez, armed with his sketchbook, to let an alternative reality suggest itself to him. Local fisherman Moses, who met Dali when he was a boy, is familiar with the artist's old haunts. These rocks appear in so many of his paintings, yeah. and it is amazing just being a few metres away from them, because suddenly it feels like we're floating in the middle of one of his landscapes. Exactly. Do you find when you're fishing, you pass these rocks and you see all sorts of things? Oh yeah, and it depends on the light, on the weather, and uh, yeah, you get really inspired by these rocks. Look at the camel. I can see, what, there with the, yeah, right. It looks like he's just squatted down in the exactly. middle of the desert. Exactly. And, and then it's further on... down, now there's a rhinoceros up there. Ah, oh, I love the rhinoceros. This is, Dali was obsessed with rhinos. Yeah, that's why. I thought the guy was a little bit nuts and that you'd just see things in the rocks which maybe other people couldn't see. Yeah, but you But can genuinely, see. Yeah. that looks like a rhino exactly. leaping up the rocks. Exactly. And the camel that squatted down. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to match this up to the landscape, but I'm having... There's one very famous Dali picture that I'm told is based on a specific outcrop. The picture is the extraordinarily named The Great Masturbator, and it was inspired by a rock that, to Dali at least, suggested a great face lying nose down. OK. They're all fantastical shapes. Yeah. I feel a bit like I'm approaching Skull Island or something. Is this it? This yeah, is the one. this is it. This is the one. Let's just get a better angle. Hang on. Ah, I'm starting to recognise it. There's his nose. Massive mm -hmm. nose, mm -hmm. face down. Exactly. This is it. Just looks like but a piece of bone which has been dropped here. Wow. But it looks much better from the other side. This is genuinely, this is the yeah, rock. It you is. can see yeah. it's exactly the same shape. Yeah. And it's interesting, there's a bit of rock that goes up there which corresponds to this part of the painting, which is above. <laughs> Today, the original hangs in Madrid's Reina Sofia Gallery. Amazingly, in that one rock, Dali's imagination didn't just see a face on its nose, but a disturbing array of his own sexual desires, insecurities and phobias. Here, you can see that everything coalesces, comes together. It's utterly surreal, but it's also uniquely Dali. And it gives a very, very complex, fraught vision of Dali's mind at the time. 
out of his head, in his very fluid, dreamlike way, comes this explosion of imagery. In it, he put all of his obsessions, phobias, anxieties, clamped onto the mouth of the self-portrait, is a grasshopper. He was so scared of locusts as a child, and suddenly here it is, right rammed up against his face. And over on this side, you have this, well, it's not really suggestive, it's quite explicit, kind of petrified, rather beautiful woman's face, looking at the nether regions of a bloke, which is standing nearby. And beneath it, almost like a parody of this part, is the lion's face, but with his tongue really lewdly lolling out and standing up on end. But around it are these fangs, which are saying, hmm, maybe all is not that well in the bedroom. And if you look right down here, you see this figure in the distance, and his long shadow leads you right to the horizon where, and it's so tiny, that's probably a memory of Dali with his mother or his father walking on the beach at Cadiz. And I love that sense of complete distortions of scale with a real clarity, a luminosity that, as a picture, works beautifully. This just holds together. In 1929, Dali took the imagery he dreamt up for his paintings and reworked them into a film, the extraordinary Un Chien Andalou, which he made with his art school friend and filmmaker, Luis Bunuel. An astonishingly weird nightmare of irrational and gruesome images, combined with absurd humor, it was a landmark moment in both the history of surrealism and cinema. On the evening of the premiere, Dali and Bunuel supposedly carried stones in their pockets just in case the crowd reacted badly and things got really out of hand. But it was a triumph. Andre Breton was amazed. He wrote, with Dali, it is perhaps for the first time that our mental windows have been opened wide. Dali may have been a latecomer to the movement, but the Surrealists quickly recognised that this provocative young talent was their new champion. One of Surrealism's greatest legacies has been in film and television, and particularly in comedy. Today's comedians, such as the League of Gentlemen, or the Mighty Boosh, like Dali, combine the absurd with the macabre, the profound with the ridiculous. Eels! Eels! So how much does the comedian Noel Fielding, who stars in the Mighty Boosh, owe to Dali? I think with surrealism, it's what me and Julian call like a snot bubble laugh, which is like where you laugh because you can't stop yourself laughing because it's so absurd. You don't sort of... Because there's two types of laugh. You watch Roy Bremner or something, it's good or whatever, but you sort of go, oh, yeah, that's good, yeah, and you go, <laughs> but then there's a sort of laugh. Hopefully you get out of our show, Vic Reed's show, which is like, Pfft, where you just go, that's actually ridiculous, and you just sort of can't stop yourself laughing because it's just your brain... The absurdity of it has made your brain slightly implode. I don't want to do comedy that people could do themselves, you know. For me, that's the criteria, and that's what I like about Dali. He has ideas that I don't think, when you're walking around a museum, you think you could have had yourself. I just like the ideas. First time I saw a sort of burning giraffe, like a giraffe on fire. It's in the back of one of the paintings, I can't remember which one it is, but it's not even very big. It's just in the corner. I just thought, that's amazing. <laughs> I have to sort of know more about this person. If you had to pinpoint what you find particularly funny about Dali, what would it be? Um, he's like a sort of... He's sort of like a make-believe character, isn't he? He turned everything upside down. He was committed, I think, to being a surrealist and to getting a reaction. And I think that makes him authentic, and I think that only good comedy is authentic. In the summer of 1929, basking in his success within the Surrealist camp, Dali returned to Cadaquez, where a major change was about to occur in his private life too. Before long, he'd meet his future wife, soulmate and lifelong muse, Gala. Soon, they'd buy a tiny fisherman shack just over the bay here in the remote village of Port Legat, and this would be their home for the following 50 years. Over the decades, it expanded into a labyrinth of whitewashed rooms dedicated to dreams and pleasure. Russian-born Gala was 10 years older than Dali, and when they first met in the summer of 1929, she was already married to the French surrealist poet Paul Eluard. But with Dali, it was love at first sight, 
and over the summer they grew ever closer. So much so that she left her husband and child to be with Dali. Gala became Dali's muse and manager. Over the years, she appeared in more than 50 of his paintings. She has been described as part tiger, part martyr, part mother, part mistress, and part banker. This is Dali's studio. And what an amazing space. You can see immediately, look at these enormous windows just letting in all of this beautiful Port Legat light. He just had to look out the window and he'd see this view, which almost was like a ready-made painting. He just had to transcribe it on the canvas and there was a beautiful landscape. You can imagine a couple of melting watches floating there and you've got your Dali masterpiece. He always sat down in this white armchair and had the canvas arranged on this structure in front of him. And this is really, really ingenious. It actually allows Dali to move the canvas up and down through the floor so he could paint on this vast scale. And you can see all of his paints and brushes, the details so precise and were so important to him that he had to use these tools, these very, very fine sable hair brushes to kind of get the effects that he needed. The combination of Gala's support and this wonderful location was a catalyst for Dali. Here, in the 1930s, he produced many of his most famous paintings. They have the classic Dali elements. The desolate landscapes, stark light, sharp shadows, mutated, displaced objects, and optical illusions. Here, a half-kneeling figure becomes a hand holding an egg. This is the grand entrance to Dali's house at Port Legat. In fact, this small space was the original fisherman's shack that he bought. So, first of all, this is the only bit that he lived in. Gradually, the whole place evolved and expanded outward like cellular growth. And in later years, when people came to meet them, well, you can see they'd been met by this ferocious polar bear. Dali's surprisingly tasteful home is full of these unusual and unexpected objects. With the exotic stuffed animals, the giant eggs, weird sculptures, and sexually suggestive shapes, it's like walking into one of his paintings. But then Dali took surrealism far beyond just painting. It permeated every aspect of his life. In the 1930s, he was a pioneer of the surreal object. He would combine unusual and unlikely everyday things, which, when together, would become something absurd, yet strangely affecting. Most famously of all, he created the lobster telephone. One man who bought into Dali's surreal objects was the British patron Edward James. I've come to his Sussex mansion to meet art curator Ghislaine Wood and see some of the work that he commissioned. Hi, Ghislaine. Hi, Alistair. hi, Alistair. Hi. What a grand place. It is. It's amazing, isn't it? This is the, the vast country house of Edward James, who was a millionaire patron of Salvador Dali and lots of other surrealist artists, actually. And he was probably the most important patron of contemporary art in Britain in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and this was his parents' house, this vast country pile. Uh, but he didn't feel very comfortable here. So he actually moved into the hunting lodge in the grounds of West Dean, Monkton House and transformed it into this extraordinary surrealist environment. It's bright purple. It is. He covered the exterior in this incredible stucco and then painted it bright purple. It became a showcase house for Edward's collection of surrealist works. What he did was actually take Dali's ideas and then have them made by his decorating firm. What, what sort of things? Well, the lip sofa, which is just over here, one of the most iconic objects what, created. This is possibly the sexiest sofa I've ever seen. It is. It's the May West Lip Sofa. I mean, it's a very playful piece. 
But if you want to take it further, it has all these other more disturbing, perhaps, meanings. Here we have the idea of fetishization just completely embodied, um, all sorts of very erotic and disturbing ideas, uh, but in a piece of sort of luxury interior design. Well, hang on a sec, because I'm looking at this and it looks like a very sumptuous pair of plump, juicy pink lips. You're saying this is dark and disturbing. Well, it is, because if you think about it, you sit in the mouth. As soon as um, you interact with this object, you're creating a dialogue between you and the object, which, of course, is um, what Dali was so brilliant at doing and what much contemporary art has, has, has explored later on. Um, but, of course, the idea is that you are being swallowed into this female mouth. But upstairs we can see another version, a one in red felt. Well, Edward James loved it so much that he got it repeated again he and did. again. And, in fact, Edward had five made. Wow. That's incredible, yes. Um, Imagine having this at the foot of your bed. Can I just say that this is probably the most famous, one of the most famous things of the 20th century, and this is just in Edward James's bedroom. It actually was made as a working telephone. It's your ultimate surrealist composite object. What it does is it takes two completely disparate um, pre-existing things, a lobster and a telephone, puts them together and creates a fantastic new reality. But why do you think that this one has become so incredibly famous? It's a very simple idea, brilliantly done. Of course, there's this fantastic slippage between the shape of the receiver and the lobster, but also the idea of talking to a lobster is, of course, you know, a very witty and, and humorous thing. And I love this chair. This is obviously just a pun on armchair. Clip. It is. And again, derived from an idea by Salvador Dali. These arms um, are really grasping for someone's bottom to come and sit on it. Well, indeed, or tickling your back, depending on, you know, how you, how you um, sit in it. But, I probably uh, just revealed too much about myself. Though. Well, indeed. I mean, that's the thing about Dali. It's all very subjective and personal. It's not just Edward James's home that's been shaped by Dali. Surrealism's playful and unexpected transformation of everyday objects has had a huge influence on interior design. One thing that Dali's surrealist objects teach us is that anything is possible. Why shouldn't a lobster or even a hamburger be a telephone? Or why can't you sit on an enormous orange dog in the privacy of your own home? One thing that Dali's introduced into the world of interior design is this sense of playfulness and wit and fun. I mean, look at this. This is a contemporary piece. It's a chair by the designer David Pomper. It's got these little silver legs. I just know that Dali would have loved this. This is really a latter-day surrealist object. By now, Dali's ambitions were limitless. And ever the provocateur, he wanted to preach the gospel of surrealism to as wide an audience as possible. And in the 30s, there was only one place in the world where he could really do that. New York. We all know that today's artists manipulate the way they're presented in the media. Everyone from Madonna and Tracy Emin to Lady Gaga play up to the cameras and understand the power of publicity. But in many ways, it was Dali who blazed a trail for them. When he arrived here in New York, the circus had come to town. New York became a showcase for Dali's work. He exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art, designed shop windows on Fifth Avenue, and even made a surreal installation at the World's Fair. He called his creation the Dream of Venus, a pleasure dome filled with naked women and unfettered desire. The persistence of memory was unveiled in New York in 1932. It was originally bought for just $250, but the reaction to it and to Dali was immense. Dali once said, fame was as intoxicating to me as a spring morning, and here in America, he found fame like he'd never known it before. He loved it here. Ever the consummate showman, he quickly realised that America might just be his oyster, and soon enough, he was swept up in a frenzy of self-promotion. In 36, he appeared on the cover of Time magazine, which was a huge deal for a, an eccentric young Spanish artist who was barely into his 30s. The reporter at the time said that Dali had a faculty for publicity that should turn any circus press agent green with envy. And it was true. Dali was a master at staging spectacular stunts that generated huge amounts of hype. 
He appeared in Life magazine six times, and he even created his own newspaper, which was called, of course, the Daily News. Dali was one of the first artists in history to so wantonly court publicity. He was also one of the first to inject some irreverent fun into the pompous, earnest world of fine art. He was the trailblazer for later superstar artists like Andy Warhol, and more recently, Damien Hirst and Jeff Koons. This studio belongs to Jeff Koons, one of the most successful artists working anywhere in the world today. His art sells for millions of dollars, and it's witty, playful, and irreverent, and definitely draws upon Dali's sense of the surreal. He's absolutely one of my favourite artists, so I'm really excited to be meeting him. Koons and his team transform familiar objects into witty and pretty bizarre works of art. Recently, his work has included inflatable toys that pay homage to Dali's moustache and his love of lobsters. When I uh, saw this, you know, uh, you know, I loved the shape of it, that it's both uh, male and female. But if you look at the tentacles, it's very much like Dali's moustache. Hugely like it, yeah. And but it also it so it's, it's masculine. It has arms like an acrobat, quite athletic. But the tail, the tail's like you know. Uh, uh, of Venus. Yeah. It's, uh, but is this, so in a way, feminine. your portrait of Dali? I think it makes reference to Dali and one of Dali's great friends, Marcel Duchamp. They always print on these pool toys that this is not a life-saving device, but you know, art is a life-saving device. And so I always like that uh, kind of contradiction. And also, this gives you a sense of equilibrium when you're in the water. Koons's work is joyfully surreal. From his balloon dog and silver rabbit to his huge puppy made out of flowers, you can see the debt to Dali, who he first encountered when he was a teenager. I met Dali in '73, so uh, I found out that he was at the St. Regis Hotel, and so I called up and he answered the phone, and I, I told him I'm just a young artist. Uh, I would love to meet him, and he said, "Well, you know, come up Saturday morning, and I'll meet you at the hotel at noon." I arrived, I was there, and right at noon, he was in the lobby, and he had on a, a fur coat, and he had a, a tie with diamond pins in it, and an elaborate cane. I, I have a photo I'd love Thanks to show you. Sure. But uh, this is a, a photograph of, uh, from that uh, moment, and I just remember that, you know, I was very, uh, uh, I was excited, and I remember him saying, you know, uh, you have to hurry up. He fixed his mustache, he put it up, and he said, you have to hurry up, Jeff, because, you know, I can't hold this pose all day. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if he said Jeff, but probably young boy or something. You'd like to think he did. And, uh, that evening, I really thought, well, you know, I can do this too. I mean, you know, art can be a, a complete way of life for me. I can spend all my time uh, doing it. And I really had a, a sense of uh, possibility. You know, I think Dali very much was about kind of the uh, expansion of of uh, horizon and a possibility, a great symbol of the avant-garde. So Dali's work expanded the boundaries of what's possible, challenging and unsettling us by throwing together the unexpected. And that's just what we see walking down today's catwalks, like the late Alexander McQueen's designs, which drew on unlikely way out references. Even high street fashion has embraced surrealism, and this is largely thanks to Dali, who back in the 30s was turning clothes into an extension of his art. Taking inspiration from his paintings, like this one, he and fashion designer Elsa Schiaparelli created a range of surrealist tinged clothing. The tear dress created the illusion of ripped skin showing the flesh beneath and the shoe hat turned convention on its head. They even designed a dress featuring Dali's favourite crustacean, which he thought was somehow sexually suggestive. An illusion perhaps not lost on Wallace Simpson just before she married Edward VIII. And today, celebrities like Lady Gaga 
certainly continue the tradition of seriously surreal fashion. The glittering world of high fashion acquainted Dali with jewellery, another delight for his inventive spirit. He designed brooches like tearful eyes and ruby red lips with pearls for teeth. But it wasn't just wearable jewellery. Typically, Dali pushed things even further later in his career, blurring the line between jewellery and sculpture, creating jaw-droppingly intricate objects that on closer inspection deliver a surreal twist. In 2007, Damien Hirst made headlines with his skull covered in more than 8,500 diamonds. It was on sale for 50 million pounds. But Dali had got there first. More than half a century before Damien Hirst caused a sensation with his diamond skull, Dali was already designing jewellery, and pretty weird jewellery at that. This piece is called the Royal Heart, and it consists of a heart made of rubies that's beating in the middle of a gold setting. It's not to everybody's taste. It's quite brash and possibly even grotesque, but there's something quite mesmerising about watching this very hard substance, the ruby, look incredibly soft and flesh-like there in the middle of the brooch. By the 1940s, Dali had produced numerous surrealist masterpieces, made a groundbreaking film, and introduced surrealism to fashion and jewellery. The really weird thing is that even though Dali had done all of this stuff to promote surrealism right around the world and make it this incredibly famous and popular artistic movement, the founder of the movement, André Breton, wasn't happy. And he actually expelled Dali from the surrealists altogether, ridiculing his love of fame and money with a catchy anagram that transformed Salvador Dali into a vida dollars, which basically means greedy for bucks. More seriously, the predominantly left-wing surrealists took deep offence when Dali failed to protest against the rise of fascism across Europe. They particularly disapproved of him depicting Hitler in some of his paintings. The surrealists may have disowned him, but Dali didn't care. He thought he was surrealism, with or without the official stamp. He simply aimed his sights higher and headed to Hollywood, known as the Dream Factory after all. Everybody comes to Hollywood. We wanna make it in the neighborhood. As soon as he arrived, he was in the limelight, throwing lavish, bizarre, and star-studded parties. Ever since Dali's early success with his surreal films, he'd been keen to return to the biggest, most mainstream canvas on offer, cinema. In 1944, Alfred Hitchcock commissioned Dali to design the dream sequences for his new psychological thriller, Spellbound. The film starred Ingrid Bergman as a frosty psychoanalyst who falls in love with her amnesiac patient, played by Gregory Peck, who might or might not be a killer. It was one of the first films to treat the subject of psychoanalysis seriously, paving the way for Hitchcock's later masterpieces like Psycho and Vertigo. The studio loved the idea of Dali's involvement because it guaranteed free publicity. They estimated that the commercial value of his name was $50,000, an enormous amount for the 40s. And for his part, Dali believed that he was about to ignite Hollywood with his surrealist art. seemed to be a gambling house, but there weren't any... Dali designed the backdrops for a dream sequence in which he revisited the eye-slitting moment that he'd devised in Chien Andalou. Hitchcock understood exactly why Dali was going to work so well on film. I requested uh, Dali. Selznick, the producer, had the impression that I wanted Dali for the publicity value. Yeah. That wasn't it at all. 
What I was after was, again, the thing we talked about earlier, the vividness of dreams. As you know, all Dali's work is very solid and very sharp, with very long perspectives and, and black shadows. This was, again, the avoidance of the cliché. All dreams in movies are blurred. It isn't true. Dali was the best man for me to do the dreams because that's what dreams should be. So that was the reason I had Dali. During the filming of Spellbound, Dali met another filmmaker with whom he could collaborate, Walt Disney. At the beginning of 1946, Dali arrived here at the Walt Disney Studios to work on a six-minute animated film called Destino. For the next eight weeks, he clocked in every morning like a regular employee and headed down Dopey Drive to make his preparatory sketches. Dali loved the creative possibilities of animation. Now he could take all the elements of his paintings, the melting forms, illusions and optical trickery, to a fantastical new level. Dali's animation was in fact never made in his lifetime. Instead, his drawings remained here in the Disney archives until 2003, when animator Dave Bossert finally brought Dali's vision to life. Dali had always admired Walt Disney's uh, animation. He thought that that was the, the, a natural extension of surrealism. I've got a couple examples of some of the visual development work that he did. And this is actually one of my favorite pieces. I really like this piece a lot. Um, there's a baby carriage for this woman's head, and she's wearing the snail slippers, uh, which are kind of interesting. What does uh, it mean? You know, it beats me. I don't know what it means, but I like looking at it. This one, it's showing our, our hero. She's actually sort of dancing up this incline, and there's this vat of eyeballs here. Uh, and uh, when she gets up to the top, she's going to go off and fall into a big basket of eyeballs. Don't ask me to tell you what that means. Anything like melting clocks uh, or a telephone receiver like a spider. Uh, those things are just perfect for animation. Absolutely perfect. They're whimsical, they're fantasy, they're fun. Uh, those are the types of things you want to see in animation. By the 1950s, Dali was the world-famous champion of surrealism and would try his hand at almost anything. As the years passed, his moustache grew ever longer, and his behaviour became ever more eccentric. Like a circus showman, he constantly engineered weird stunts that would attract headlines. One of many was his 12-metre-long loaf of bread. Many felt that Dali was undermining his reputation. They were dismayed that the man who'd created such groundbreaking and influential work was descending into buffoonery. But Dali's antics popularised surrealism, taking it far beyond the elite world of fine art. Today, it's everywhere. You can hardly turn on your TV without encountering the surreal. I've come to meet top ad exec Robert Senior to find out why today's commercials in particular are so often so surreal. I mean, I just should start by saying I really love that ad. And part of the reason I think I love it is because you've got this gorilla who looks so soulful and sort of kind of sad and a bit melancholy, and then he just lets rip and he starts drumming. It's all really good fun. What it's got to do with chocolate, I do not know at all. But my understanding is that it works. The start point was I want to bring to, we want to bring to life, dramatise, if you like, unbridled joy. Why a gorilla? Why not? 
Well, but isn't that precisely the point of surrealism? Uh, things are so much more beguiling the less you understand them. Yeah. But something else like, I don't know, a lizard doing the can-can, that, that wouldn't work. It could have been. You see, that's the wrong lens. That's the lens to try and understand why, to try and apply a cognitive analysis to it, is to miss the point. Its, it's start point is not, I want you to think differently about this. The start point is, I want you to feel an emotion about that. The art of a great salesman is they don't have to sell. And, and surrealism takes you away from the real, quite literally, into another place. And it makes you feel something that you can't quite rationalize. If you take Dali himself, I think he really understood branding in its truest sense. He understood the importance of being, um, of, of the element of surprise. And that's just great. And yet he was very consistent in that, included in how he presented himself. And, and that's, that's, that's the mark of a great brand. He understood branding so much that he actually started appearing in ads. <laughs> and I brought along a disc with a couple of his um, best ads on it. And I'd like to, I don't, I don't think you've ever seen them. I don't no, know. I, I, haven't, I haven't seen them. No. But it'd be good to get your yeah, professional opinion ahead, if, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah. Happy wobbles, but devoted wobbles. Then the Alka Seltzer shoots into the stomach. Here, he neutralizes that bad excess acid. Meantime, the special hippopotamus aspirin is speeding into your bloodstream to all places of pain. So those beautiful places will feel beautiful again. Alka-Seltzer is a work of art, truly one of a kind, like uh, Dali. Je suis fou du chocolat l'envers. I think the first one for the Alka-Seltzer yeah. uh, was genius. It's a magnificently engaging product demo. It's fantastic, because it's bonkers. And you have a surrealist being surreal about an incredibly logical piece of science. That's a juxtaposition, if ever there was one. I think that was great. I think the chocolate one was pointless. Pointless? Yeah, I pointless. love the chocolate one. Yeah, but it's just, yeah, exactly, great. And you'll buy it and I won't. That's how it goes. <laughs> That's how it works. So Dali was more than happy to peddle his own brand of surrealism for commercial gain. Like here, in an advert for stockings. Dali even designed the logo for this incredibly familiar lollipop. Now I had loads of these when I was a kid, and what I never actually knew was that all the time I was licking a surrealist work of art. Despite the stunts and commercial ventures, Dali's post-war career did deliver some of his most popular paintings. A new fascination with religion informed pictures like The Temptation of Saint Anthony. Recalling the imagery of his childhood, Dali fused the Virgin with Gala in his painting The Madonna of Port Legat. The crucifixion inspired him too. In 1951, he painted Christ of St. John on the cross. Its bold perspective, apparently inspired by a dream, reveals the coast of Cadaquez beneath a hovering cross. And with the onset of the Cold War and the nuclear age, another big theme caught his imagination. Just as Freud had preoccupied Dali earlier in his career, now nuclear physics, the science behind the atom bomb, obsessed him most of all. He was about to enter a new phase as an artist and would soon anoint himself the first painter of the atomic age. He christened this phase nuclear mysticism and began reworking, some say recycling, his most famous motifs, reflecting how the fabric of life is made up of moving atoms. Everything jumping and rumping in a completely extraordinary eurythmic feeling. And all your life will be to the rhythm of atomic explosion. Exactly, one new kind of uh, atomic and nuclear mysticism. In the 60s and 70s, Dali split his time between his home in Spain Paris and New York. 
performing that famous caricature version of himself, and continuing to court publicity and controversy. This is where Dali stayed whenever he was in New York, the rather grand St. Regis Hotel, where he held court, entertained his many admirers and acolytes, and got up to all sorts of incredibly surreal mischief. His HQ was in the hotel bar, and here, every Sunday evening, crowds would arrive to get a glimpse of the great artist. In the 70s, artist Louis McCoya befriended him here. There was a round table that Dolly was sitting at with large candelabra lit and uh, it was very much like a talk show host thing where Dolly was the host and the most famous, the most rich or the most outrageous person was the one that got to sit next to him next. Anybody who's rich and famous stopped by, the Rolling Stones, the Grateful Dead, you know, you, you name the people, David Bowie, uh, Andy Warhol was always here. Warhol had at one time made a gift to Dolly of a Marilyn uh, lithograph that he had done. So he brought it to Dolly. gave him one of the Marilyns. He, he gave him one of the Marilyns. It was, I, I would say, 24 inches square, something like that. He didn't think Warhol was a very good painter at all. And, and Dolly promptly put it on the floor, unzipped his fly, and pissed on it. Well, in front of it? In, in front of Warhol, which Warhol didn't mind at all. He thought it was really great. There was a lot of wild stuff. There was a time where we talked about horseshoe crabs because of their shape and because they had these projectiles that look like rhinoceros horns that I had made helmets for Dolly and Gala actually really? to wear. Can I, can I model it? Yes, you more than happy to, to Do, put which it way on. Around does this thing it, go? it goes on like this, you just, just yeah, put it on. It, it, has, it has a velvet liner, so you just yeah. put your elastic on. What do you reckon? We just wore them for the night in the bar actually here and uh, just saw the reactions of people. I've also brought a project that I did with Dolly uh, that came to be known the Flying Fried Eggs. Essentially, three fried eggs on a hovercraft. Uh, this is a toy, is it? The hovercraft, it, it, the is, hovercraft a is a toy. But Dolly had fried eggs in many of his paintings, and I uh, brought the idea to him, and we made this toy. This is that, great. I love it. So we made the, the fried eggs, and we walked them into the lobby, and we walked them from here to the, to the plaza, and created a huge commotion. By the time we got to the plaza, there's probably four or five hundred people following the eggs. He really was the carrier of surrealism and, and lived it all the time. Dolly's exhibitionist clowning helped destroy the archetype of the solemn, suffering artist. Come on. Art and artists in the future would be a lot more playful, irreverent and conspicuous. But Dali wasn't just playing the fool in the final decades of his life. Back home in Spain, he'd been working on his last great project, a monument to that brand of surrealism that had become his life's work. This is the Dali Theatre Museum in Figueres. You could call it the largest surrealist object in the world. Its design encapsulates lots of Dali's obsessions. The golden statuettes refer to Hollywood, there are eggs, spherical atoms, and the red facade is studded with these bread rolls, which Dali thought were like goosebumps ruffling the building's skin. He wanted everyone who visited his museum to feel like they were walking into a theatrical dream. This place is unbelievable. This is the central courtyard of Dali's Theatre Museum. And I feel like I've walked right into the middle of his brain. Dali once said that he wanted to produce a dream that could also be used as a living room. And this is what he came up with. He hung some pictures on the wall, he created a strange pink fireplace stocked with logs, and in the middle of the room he placed one of his most famous ever inventions, a ravishing pair of red lips that also double up as a sofa. And the view of it 
is much better from up here. The installation is typical of his work. It's playful, it's witty, it's unexpected, it's irreverent, it's certainly surreal, and most of all, it's very, very sexy. The museum opened in 1974, and Dali, now in his 70s, painted this ceiling to commemorate what he felt was his legacy. As the managing director of the Gala Salvador Dali Foundation, Juan Manuel Sebiano, explains. The summing up of a lot of the powerful symbols he created throughout his years. His legacy will be a source of richness, wealth and well-being for his city. As you can see that there's a, a rainfall of gold there and, and all his creations dancing. This somehow leads us to, to a moment where him and Gala look at the path they will follow towards the afterlife and somehow uh, Dali comes to terms with the terror that filled his life about dying and moving on. Is it true that some people when they come here they're quite sniffy about the museum? Some people are because they come with the wrong expectations. They expect to see a museum, you know, a, a, a gallery with square rooms and paintings placed one next to each other with exactly the same separation between them and a lot of, a, a lot of literature under them, which is fine. It is a reasonable expectation. But this place is unreasonable, so uh, you have to brace for what's going to hit you once you walk in through the door. This was painted quite late on in his career, I think in the 70s. Absolutely. Some people are quite dismissive about his later works and see this kind of thing as quite kitsch and mm -hmm. almost silly with the big feet and everything. Yeah. Do you think that's unfair? I think it is. I think he, he did a whole bunch of things that were not understood back then by his contemporaries, but are now what all our great contemporary artists are doing. He was the first person to understand mass culture and understand mass communication. I think that it is, it is time that we start really understanding how important Dali was for the world of 20th century art and for what has come after. Dali died in January 1989. He was buried at the center of the museum which is now his mausoleum. When I started this film, I knew that Dali was a really brilliant painter. His early surrealist pictures really are true masterpieces of the 20th century that conjure up all the desires and also anxieties that underpin the modern world. But what I've discovered is that there's so much more to this exuberant Spanish genius. Dali liberated what it meant to be an artist, and he used that wild persona to communicate the ideas of surrealism to a worldwide audience. And just look, Dali left an indelible mark. Everything from cinema to painting, to jewellery and fashion, to design and advertising, even comedy, there isn't much that Dali hasn't changed. As he said himself, when I paint, the sea roars. The others just splash about in the bath. If you'd like to find out more about the art and the influence of Matisse, Picasso, Dali and Warhol, then go online to bbc.co.uk forward slash modern masters. And that was the final part of Modern Masters. Living out our high street dreams here on BBC HD tomorrow night at nine. But back to tonight and there's comedy next, live at the Apollo. You're crazy in the coconut. What does that mean? That boy needs therapy. I'm gonna kill that you. That boy needs therapy. Hi, Let's have a duel.